Hey, Jolene. Good to see you. Hey, Freya. How are you? Really good. It's great to see so many people jumping on for this really important conversation. Eight o'clock on a Thursday night. What better things to talk about than our democracy? <laughs> I promise it's an interesting topic. So lots of scandal involved. For sure. So before we start off, I would like to acknowledge the country I'm on. I'm on Ngunnawal country and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their deep connection to the land that I'm living and working on. Jolene, I don't know if you want to jump in and also acknowledge the country you're on. Yeah, absolutely. I am in Melbourne or Narm, Wurundjeri country. And um, I think every time we're talking about issues of democracy, I just think it's really I like to remind myself that democracy is also a system that was imposed on our First Nation people of Australia. So we have a lot of work to do yet in that realm. Um, and I acknowledge the elders past, present and any um, First Nations people that are joining us right now. Yeah, thanks, Jolene. So for everyone that's on, we are we will soon be inviting Craig Rucastle, who we're really excited to talk about. Uh, he is certainly a pro on this topic. Um, and I'm sure you all have lots of questions. So I would like to invite you to use the comment section um, at the bottom. We've got a social media moderator looking at these comments and he will feed back uh, any of your questions back to me and I can bring those into the discussion that we're having tonight. Um, so please do, if anything pops up, please do put it in that comment section. So we will just wait as we do with these Instagram lives for more and more people to join. We do appreciate you being here tonight. And right on eight o'clock, we'll be bringing Craig in, who of course is the director of The Big Deal documentary, which hit our TV screens last year and was an absolutely brilliant insight into democracy in Australia. And Jolene, you also played a huge part in that. Yeah, I mean, I find, um, and apologies, because I'm looking through how to get Craig on board for our start at eight. Um, but yeah, big deal. If you haven't seen it, it's just such a um, really groundbreaking explanation of the problem our political system's facing right now with dark money. So it's really exciting to have Craig here tonight because he's um, has so much to say about these issues after filming that. All right, let's bring him in. It's two minutes to wait, but I, I reckon he'll be there waiting for us. I'm having a look. And so for all of those who are jumping in and out of this live discussion, of course, this week, the Australian Electoral Commission updated its database of financial disclosure information for 2020 and 2021. There's a lot of information in there to unpack. And of course, um, the Australian Conservation Foundation and, and everyone who works in the environment movement takes a really good look at who our political donor donors are. Um, and we're going to get into all of that in just a moment. It's great to see the numbers coming up. Um, like with any of these Instagram lives on a Thursday night, it's, it's difficult to know who's going to join and who isn't. So. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for being here. And we're about to launch into this really important conversation that impacts us all. Um, it's, it is our democracy. It's everyday Australians. We, we own this democracy. And at the moment, it's not equal. So uh, yeah, we'll be joining. Craig's messaging me, actually. So we might be having <laughs> issues. <laughs> let, me, let me just check this out. Jolene, while we're just um, getting Craig onto Insta, it might be worthwhile you running through what your role is at the Australian Conservation Foundation and giving people a bit of an update as to why you're such an expert in this field. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, I am very lucky to have the role of democracy campaigner at ACF, and it's a newer position. We've been running a democracy program for just over three years now. And the reason we started because um, as an organization trying to solve the climate crisis and protect nature, 
we came to the realization that our democracy really wasn't functioning in a way that was working for people and planets. So we took a deep dive to look at what are the blockers, why a, a healthy democracy would make uh, decisions in the best interest of people and our planet. And that just isn't what we have been seeing. Um, so we did this deep dive to look into it and we found a lot of different reasons, a lot of different solutions from, you know, better civics education in Australia to, um, you know, expanding the voting rights to younger people was a solution that came up many, many things. But the one thing that everybody agreed with was the power of corporations over our democracy and how um, that undue influence that's wielded by many large corporations is able to influence our decision making in the interest of private corporations rather than what's in the public interest. And that's across every issue, whether it's you care about gambling reform, whether you care about health care, there's a powerful corporate lobby who is lobbying really hard and often drowning out the voices of everyday people. And that's certainly the case in the climate area. Um, and so that's my job. And I always look through the political donations every year because it's one of the most interesting places to find insights into who's influencing our politicians. Thanks, Jolene. And I'm going to take over chatting for a bit. I'm just gonna make sure that um, Craig's been joined to this conversation. <laughs> We can all have a laugh about it in a moment, but Craig was worried about using Instagram for this, but we'll roll with it. <laughs> I'm having a look now to see if I can find him. So I wanted to have a bit of a chat to you all about um, who I am. My name's Freya and I'm moderating this discussion on behalf of the Together We Can movement. Um, Together We Can is for everyday Australians who want to see the action we need on climate and nature this decade to ensure we're all living in a safe, a safe and healthy future. And transparency and democracy very much plays into the role climate action, um, very much plays into that. And it's, it's um, absolutely integral that we get as many everyday Australian voices joining the Together We Can movement. So please, if you enjoy this discussion, um, follow us on Instagram and you can sign up and we will be taking every single voice and story to Canberra 100 days into the next government to ensure that no matter who wins this election, the government will be surrounded by a huge number of everyday Australians. Hey! <laughs> Speaking Sound of up. everyday Australians. <laughs> I told you I'm bad at this here, Mark. Here's Craig. Welcome. <laughs> Good to be here. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Not your problem. Um, we love tech issues in our in our space. So um Welcome, Craig. I was just kind of wrapping up what the Together We Can movement is, but I'm really keen to launch into the discussion while we're all here. Dark money in Australian politics. It's absolutely rampant. We know the AEC has just updated its database. What's your reaction, reaction as somebody who's just done a whole documentary about political donations? What's your reaction to what's come out this week? It's this it's more of the same. It's exactly the same problems repeated. Here we are finding out information from, you know, six months, 12 months ago that's kind of become less relevant already. And there are so many instances where the information is being hidden still. There's still enormous amounts of influence flowing from enormous sectors of the economy that, that you know, unfortunately have a disproportionate influence on, the, on our government. So it's it's just all the same. It's really disappointing. It is disappointing. Jolene, can you talk us through some of the specifics in the data that, that will be of interest to people? Yeah, definitely. And um, I might point out, Craig, you're coming in quite uh, muffled. So if any volume uh -huh. can pick up, go for it. Okay. Um, but yeah, so for, for people not familiar with the data, like the thing is, is that in this 21st century, on February 1st, the Australian Electoral Commission just dumps thousands and thousands of pages of scanned documents online. Um, and some of this is over 20 months old um, because from the fiscal, the last fiscal year, so we're looking now at 2020-21 fiscal year, which started in July 1st, 2020. So we're finding out about this now, you know, over well over um, a year and a half later. 
off the bat, like the system has issues because A, it's not very easy to access. And B, lacking accountability because by the time we find out about these questions, it, they're sometimes not relevant, not as time right? Um, but essentially, so the donations data dump, as I like to call it, because it really is this big data dump, is our chance to find out who's giving to, to the major parties um, and who's really funding the campaigns. And some of that comes from taxpayers, it comes from, you know, the AEC, the Electoral Commission giving funds. Um, some of it is parties' own investments, but the vast majority, majority of it comes from corporations. And it comes from corp the corporations that are most heavily regulated. So we're talking banks, we're talking gas and coal companies, we're talking the gambling industry and the property industry. Um, and, you know, the, the, this year we saw coal and gas companies, again, one of the largest donors to over $2.1 million flowing into just the major parties. And that's the, the stuff we know about. I mean, Craig, why, why do you think corporations or individuals want to keep their donations secret? Yeah, well, I mean, people don't like necessarily showing that they're supporting political parties. And, you know, they get accused of... This is part of the problem, in a sense, is the, they get accused of being a bribe. Now, in a sense, this is the, my problem with the system, right? Let's take, for instance, the, the biggest donor, which is Anthony Pratt. So Anthony Pratt donated $1.3 million, but almost all of that for the Liberal Party. He's also, over the last few years, got, like, $10 million from bushfire funds, he's got multiple, like $24 million from various recycling funds and that. Now, let's say, let's say those were great decisions that should have happened. Unfortunately, it gets tarnished by then also going, oh, there's a bit of, it feels like there's a bit of a pressure on him to give back to the political parties afterwards. I want to make sure that my political parties are making these decisions on them for the right reasons. So it tarnishes the whole trust basis of our political system to have this here. Because there are times when people are getting don you know, grants for the right reasons, but they're then making these, these donations. And sometimes, to be brutally honest with having talked to some of these people, they're making it against their own desire. They're making it because of the pressure that's put on them by the political parties. So it's a really flawed system at the moment. And that's, you know, I want to clean it up so that, that you don't have that questioning of going, well... Why did that money go to that particular company that also happens to be a massive donor? I don't want that to be the basis of my political system. I don't want to have to be asking that question. So that's, yeah, that's what frustrates me about this, is it undermines the trust of the whole system, even in cases where it may not be distorting the system. But in a lot of cases, sadly, it is distorting the system. And it's interesting, as Jolene said, like, think about it from your own perspectives, right? If you're somebody who's concerned about climate change, you know, over $2 million has been kicked in from companies that are pushing against your interest. If you're somebody who's concerned about gambling in Australia and the problem that creates for our society, but a million bucks has been kicked in against your kind of interest. If you're somebody growing up who's concerned about house prices and where you're going to live in the future, there's all of these, you know, companies like you see, Meriton's one of the top donors, probably the Liberal Party there, you know. All of these interests that you have as a person in our society are competing against these much louder voices. And that's what's frustrating about it. Yeah, you mentioned, you talked a little bit about wanting to clean up the system. So we'll get to that in a second. But Jolene, I'm really interested to know why does this impact our environment? How does this ha play a role, political donations? Yeah, I mean, look, I think Craig makes a really good point. Like, first off, whether or not it actually influences decisions. Like a lot of politicians, if you bring this up, I've got you know, giving testimony at hearings and they'll say, it absolutely doesn't influence us. Um, the first thing I would say to that is that the perception of undue influence is a huge problem for our democracy, right? Australians have heaps to be proud about the dem democratic system in Australia. There's a lot of things that are so strong about it. But the truth is that people's and democracy all over the world and here in Australia is in a steep decline. And for our politicians to not really realize that anything they can do to improve trust is, needs to happen now um, is, is really disappointing um, to not see that action. But when it, when it comes to the environment, I mean, the fact is we, there's just too many trends that point to the fact that these donations 
are often um, for trying to get access and trying to get payments, right? So we see cases where donors, uh, big companies only donate to a political party that's making decisions about uh, projects they have. This year, Chevron gave almost exclusively to the, the ALP, the Labor Party in WA, um, and they had thousands and thousands of dollars, which by the way, the ALP didn't even declare because they don't have um, And it happens to be in WA where they have giant, giant gas projects. Um, we see that with people building property on protected wetlands, like Walker Corporation and Tunda Harbor, giving really big to the political parties, making decisions about that. Um, and we saw, you know, another case out in WA where a, a cattle um, farm gate started giving massive donations just when his project was going in for an environmental review. So, you know, it's, it, there's too much of a coincidence, but the thing I would say is that in Australia, it's not often quid pro quo corruption. We're not facing something where someone gives money and then gets an outcome. What we're often seeing is this sort of, you know, you might call it clientelism where donations are being given year after year, month to build these relationships and over time that uh, influence and far more influence than the people that our politicians should be representing which is us the community john i think i think that they do get the result like i think there are a lot of instances where the donations do lead to the result is that they're clever enough to not speak of it that way like they're clever enough to go i'm giving you this money to get this it's a kind of you know the, the sophisticated political actors they know how the system works. And it's interesting looking, I was thinking, looking earlier, there was a, there was a question on the um, Instagram and on the account talking about tonight saying, oh, you know, does this cement company donate? Now, I was thinking about it. I looked it up and like, they don't specifically, but you then look at it and go, there's all these, like, like so many other ways of doing it as well. You can go, oh, I donate directly. Or you go, I donate to my, the organisation that represents my industry to then donate. Or I don't. Or I employ a a company of, of lobbyists who then go and do the work myself, and I never have to declare that. There's still so many loopholes there. So I think it is. I mean, I really do think in a lot of cases they do. It doesn't I mean, always lead to you getting what you want, but it definitely helps. And I mean, it is interesting the Chevron example in WA. Chevron carbon capture and storage. They were required to kind of capture the carbon at the, at the Gorgon plant. They didn't do it. It's stuffed up. They're not meeting the requirements. The WA government is making a decision about whether or not they have to now pay fines of that. They're kicking money into that decision. Now, so far, the, in the early stages, the WA government has been quite, quite strong on that. It was great. But you go, in what world would you allow them to then donate large amounts of money? Can you imagine if you were in a court case? And at some point, the judge, the one side of the court case gave the judge, look, we're just going to give you 50 grand. It's, a, it's an absolutely <laughs> ridiculous situation. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it. And to what you're saying, like, um, this year, one of the things that I found when I was going through the data that just was, it blows my mind, is 37% of the donations, we have no idea where they're coming from. So, like you're saying, sometimes we funnel them through their peak bodies, or we have these things called associated entities they can give donations to and then they don't have to declare them to the party. But beyond that 37%, like we don't even know where it comes from. And I'd say like, okay, if it's investment income or if it's from the AEC, you would declare it. So I wager that almost all of this 37% are corporations who are having dinners, you know, having luncheons with our politicians and donating big. I think I think there's another category in there, which is that because the, the, the limit in this federal level is put so ridiculously high, 14, you know, 14, 14,500, so you only have to be clear about that, it means you get lots of donations just below that, which still have an influence and still start that relationship there. So I don't think that's necessarily all large corporations. And that, corporations, I think, actually are more, particularly if ones that are on the actual stock exchange, are more likely to declare, as you said, you found out that Chevron declared it wasn't declared by the political parties. When we were doing the research for the show, we found that each time you go, oh, the company has been more, more honest about it, but it hasn't turned up in the political party side of things, so they're kind of hiding it. There. So, you know, there's a part of that that's people under that 40,000, but again, that's a very large amount. It's ridiculous. 
and the yeah. fact that Tasmania, I love the fact that all the articles are like, Tasmania is the worst state by far of this. And why is it the worst state? Because it's the state that follows the federal rules. And yeah. the only state that follows the federal rules. And so it's just it's ridiculous how far behind our federal system is. Yeah. So there's a few comments um, coming through. So somebody commented before, what about public interest in the environment? Um, and it sounds like, I mean, there's a lot of frustrated people. What do you have to say, you know, this impacts everybody. What do you have to say for people who are feeling really frustrated when this data comes out and we just, you know, if, if you're rich and you've got deep pockets, you can buy your way in, you can buy this privilege, but everyday Aussies can't. So what would you say to people who are feeling pretty frustrated and who care very deeply about nature and climate? I'll go first because Jolie and I know will have a better solution than that. But, yeah, you should be frustrated by that. And that's one of the annoying things about this is that, you know, polling constantly shows how much of Australia, what I mean, a large majority of Australians want action on climate change, want action on certain environmental issues. And it doesn't happen. You go, why doesn't it happen? I think and a part, big part of that is this structural problem of large donations and large influence. I found it very funny this year, actually, that Santos... Uh, didn't seem to donate to the Liberal Party. Some of them might go, that's strange. I mean, I'd almost argue that Santos and the Liberal Party have become so much one, one entity. <laughs> Not giving money to yourself now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it is frustrating. It's extremely frustrating. But I think that the thing you should... The, the positive thing out of that is that when we looked into this for the movie Big Deal, the donations don't explain everything. They don't just just explain all politics or all, all decisions. Now, there are good people in there and there are there are ways you can influence the political system by getting together and organising and organisations like the ASGF and that. So I think that you can have an influence. You just, you've got to, in a sense, get together as a group because you're battling as... The, the one person that can kick in 20,000 grand has a disproportionate influence. But if you get 2,000 people kicking in, you know, um, I'm going to screw the maths up on this, $100 or whatever, or having the influence of kind of calling up members and putting that influence. That has a pressure and, and, and importance as well. So I don't think that you should think that there's no other way around this. Yes, this is a shit system. Yes, there's a disproportionate effect. But no, it's not the only way you can affect politics. Yeah, and I think the, you know, the solutions are out there and they're clear. Right. So as Craig alluded to, almost every state and territory in Australia has stronger donations laws than at the federal level. So Queensland's a great example. It's a thousand dollar threshold. Everything above that has to be declared. They in um, 2022 of this year and we'll start in July. Sorry, get my dates right. They're introducing donation caps. So there'll be a limit on how much uh, corporations and big donors can give to political parties. Um, and they have expenditure caps, so, so big corporations and individuals, like getting rid of the cloud effect, let's say that, so that one person can't influence what is being put into the public debate. So, mm -hmm. you know, the solutions, are, as Craig is saying, we have to be louder than these small, it's really a small amount of people who are giving big, but there's a lot more of us, and I think when we combine our voice, that's when we can be the most powerful. Yeah, and we need we need it so that we do need it so that those caps on spending we don't we don't want political parties who are in the arms race constantly needing more money because that's what means they have to constantly go to oh I've got to go to this company and try and beg for a hundred grand and I've got to go to this wealthy person and beg hundred grand and that's not what you want at the core of your system you, you don't want that happening in a democracy. Hundred so, percent. Yeah. yeah. So we've got a few more questions coming in and just for everyone tuning in, please chuck your questions in the comment section. But um, Adrian Riddle, thanks for dropping in a couple of questions. Adrian wants to know, have any of the parties or independents pledged to reform political donations or even completely get rid of them? Yes. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, the the labor when we come to with major parties the labor party actually supports um lowering the disclosure threshold so a lot more transparency um i think the greens green party is really on the forefront of this have been pushing for a long time for wholesale reforms expenditure caps you know this lower threshold caps on donations um 
and the independents that we currently have in Parliament are fantastic in this. Jackie Lambie has really been fighting for this issue. We have Helen Haynes, we have Zali Stegel. They all really, really care about this. And a lot of the independents we see coming up have great policies on this. So definitely. Um, the, the thing I would say is that difficult about this area of reform is that it's done it needs to be done through bipartisan support, right? So we're talking about how political parties are funding that affect elections. And so we really need all sides of politics to support the reforms we're seeking. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, the problem is that what, what we've had at the state level is you occasionally get reform and the Liberal Party brings in reform and kind of screws over the other side. The Labor then brings in reform and screws over the head. But if, you kind of need a, an agreement amongst everyone you know, of a fairer system, and which is where the pressure needs to come from the public. And I do feel like it is starting to come more from the public. Like, the kind of general push for, you know, a national integrity commission and that kind of way that's become such a, uh, something talked about a lot in politics means that there is that pressure coming from the public. So hopefully that pushes for better reform. Another question's come in, and it's um, quite a personal one about voting. Who will you vote for and why? I think... Like my knee-jerk reaction to that is we're not here to tell you who to vote for, but it's to educate yourself about what's happening in democracy. But, Craig, I don't know if you've got a bit of an answer for that one. <laughs> yeah, as someone who works at the ABC, the chances of me answering that are zero. Uh, but yeah. I, do think that, I do think that one of the things that's important about, about this issue is recognising that it's not a party political issue. Like, it is a kind of pox on all your houses, in a sense. Like, it's... It is that it's a systemic problem that affects all of the parties. All of the parties, even if they are against this, are forced to kind of go out and try and get money because they're part of this arms race. All of the parties are doing these deals. All of the, the particularly the major parties, both of them are doing dodgy hiding of donations. They've got these separate entities and all that kind of stuff. So it's not a, you can be a voter from any side of the politics and be frustrated by this. And as a matter of fact, it is one of those issues that goes across the political spectrum. I know conservative people and left-wing people who are frustrated by this thing because it's a systemic problem. Um, and and, it's, and it, it often means that you can go, I voted for this person that I knew on a personal level was really great. They got into politics and they didn't really seem to be able to achieve anything that they said they were going to do. And why is that? You go, it's partly because the system itself is part of the problem. And that's why we need to fix it. So there's... We, this data comes out every year. You've, been, you've done a whole documentary on it, Craig. Is it getting better or worse or people calling out? What do you reckon? Look, the problem is, is that there's the one time in the year where we look at it. You know, it's great for this one or, one or two weeks because it all comes out and there's deep dives done and, you know, the media organisations write some great articles about it. But it's covering its historic data. Like, so this is up to kind of... June last year, right? So the, ele the 11 months leading up to the election. So, by the way, this is, this is one of the small years because it's not the election year. The year before the election is always the big one. So the year that's going to be all the big donations and that really are going to influence things just in the lead up to the election, we don't know any of that in real time. And to go back to Jolene's point, in Queensland, that don those donations are put up digitally within, within one week. You can do that in Queensland, you can do it at the federal level. It's not difficult. So it, this is intentionally being hidden. So look, yeah, it is frustrating. Um, I, I actually think it's funny, again, I noticed that the big four consultancy firms gave slightly less this year. I was wondering, oh, is that them feeling a bit more ashamed about it and starting to pull away? And then I went, oh, it's not, not the election year, might maybe not. But you see little, you see kind of ups and downs over time, but sadly the system remains. And you... You've seen some of the big corporates in the past that have said, we're pulling out, we're not doing it, and then they come back in. And that's because they put under pressure. They put under pressure as well by the political party. There is, this is a two-way kind of holding people over the barrel, really. Yeah. Another question's come in, and it's a really good one from Lucy. Are there caps of what parties can spend during election campaigns, and should there be? No, there aren't, and yes, there should be. And it's probably one of the most important things because think about Clive Palmer, right? We have a ridiculous system in Australia where you can have 
a mining baron say, I'm going to spend $80 million on an election and there's nothing restricting that. It is utter bullshit. And if you put caps in place, and they've done it in New South Wales, they've done it in other states, it leads to less pressure to go out. I spoke to a politician in New South Wales who said once the spending cap came in, she said, I could pretty much do a ring around with my local area, with people that went to my local fundraisers on a small level and that, and kind of get to that amount. It didn't require me to go cup in hand to big donors and that. So, yes, how much they can spend is a massive, massive part of it. Yeah, and I would add to that because it also is why we have, it's like a, it's a cycle, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because you have, we know historically that the party who spends the most, nine out of 10 times is the party that wins. And so the parties want to, if they want to gain power or stay in power, they're going to try to spend as much as they can, which means they have to spend a lot of time smoozing and giving donations um, and, you know, they do that through the fundraising dinners and stuff like that that I mentioned. But if you have a few major donors that are funding your campaign, tell me that you're not going to think twice before you put a policy in place that really pisses them off. Like, of course you are, because that's, you know, they're funding your campaign, so you have to think about that. If you look at the UK, Canada, New Zealand, they all have expenditure caps. Um, so this is something that Australia is really far behind in. Yeah, thank you. Another great one has come in. It's really relevant to the Together We Can movement is how do we convince everyday people that having a discourse with their MPs is something that should be normal? Um, this person feels like it's part of the problem that everyday Aussies are disconnected from what's happening up behind me at, in Canberra. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. So I, I, I knew somebody that worked in a, you know, political office and kind of got all the letters and had to respond to that. It's interesting how those kind of things do have an impact. Um, you know, like, you think about it, and this is, I guess, let me put it this way. If we don't write into our politicians, if they don't get those letters and they don't get us calling up and they don't get us tweeting at them or Facebook messaging them, we don't, don't have that engagement. Who are they listening to? I'll tell you who they're listening to. And down in Canberra, they're surrounded by an enormous pile of thousands and thousands of lobbyists who are paid and have got special passes that allow them to walk around the corridors of Parliament and knock on the politicians' doors. They already have better access than us. They already have connections to those people already. They already have a stronger voice that way. So we're not then trying to increase the way we... We're not balancing that by, as a community, going to them and talking to them then they're only hearing one side of the story. And again, I would say, going back to that point about getting together in a group in your local area or, you know, joining a, an advocacy group that, that reflects your views, if you, can, if you can kind of be, rather than just being 100 people who separately talk to your politician, if you can be a group of 100 or 1,000 people who say, we all think this, that's also going to have a stronger voice as well. So, you know, if we don't talk to them, somebody else is. Yeah, and I, th I think... Like the sense that I got from that conversation with someone who is active, who wants to inspire other people to be active, because I think a lot of us, like we all were there at one point in our lives where we were afraid to contact our MP. And, you know, there was some process that we all went through to, to start feeling comfortable or that we had to do it. And so I think like um, it's also looking for the little ways that we can take leadership in that sense, like hosting the dinner where you talk about how important that is or taking part in you know a, a together an action or any group that you're part of where you're bringing other people in your circle in um it, it's hard i know but it's the things that you know we have to pull those around us along with us yeah it's interesting john because if you look at if you look at this kind of anti-vax sentiment if you look at certain things mm. that have happened during the, the pandemic what you recognise is that people are more likely to listen to people that are close to them. Sometimes yeah. that can be on disinformation, but it also, you know, that is kind of, you know, we all talk about News Limited having an amazing power. We also have an amazing power because our friends and people near us and in our community are actually more likely to listen to us than they are to listen to something else. Yeah, yeah for sure. Well, um, I'm going to take one more question. I think it's a bit of a no-brainer, but Matt Morgan, reckon it's time to ban fossil fuel donations altogether? 
Yes, I think it is time. <laughs> well, like, you know, the, the fascinating thing about this, we talked about it going back to this, is that the National Party is still taking donations from Philip Morris and cigarette companies. He's <laughs> going, Yeah. I saw someone else asked about gun, you know, armaments. It's like, uh, other took, I can't remember the figure, but a lot from um, the gun lobby. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, pretty exactly. dark dark world really so let's wrap it up with a couple of closing comments from you for um from you both jolene you first just what people can do to to try and be more involved and to try and clean up our democracy what would you say to to people on this call and people watching afterwards as well look i think like thank you for joining tonight because the more that we know about this and talk about it with our friends and family the more we can raise this as an issue um, if you haven't watched it, watch Big Deal. Sorry, I'm getting in for you, Craig, but I think it's just like one of the best explainers. Get your friends and family to watch it. Um, and if you're not part of like a local group or an organization, to me, it's the best way to join up with others so that your voice can really be heard. It's hard as an individual. It's important as an individual to raise your voice. But when we join our voices together, that's when we grow our power so that we can combat these, um, you know, these big funds, big money that we have in our political system. Yeah. Totally agree. I totally agree. You've got to increase your voice, the, the, the loudness of your voice by joining with others because the other part of the system is people increasing their voice by large donations and lobbyists and that, and that's not accessible to all of us, unfortunately. Uh, we do need to change that, though. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Watch Big Deal and get outraged and we'll try and change the system <laughs> It's it's that's an important thing, I reckon. Yeah, exactly. It, it, is, it is frustrating. It is frustrating to see, you know, a couple million bucks coming in from fossil fuel companies. And to see, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. You see, again, people go, oh, is there any consequence of that? You kind of go, look, you know, we had that ridiculous period where we lost so much time at the beginning of the pandemic, getting our, all our efforts behind a gas fuel recovery. Well, that didn't help us in any way, shape, or form. It just shows you that these donors become part of the furniture in Canberra, and and unfortunately, it does distort our political system. So we need to uh, make sure our voices can uh, fix that up, balance it up. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you both so much for for joining, and thank you to everyone who's still online watching this. Um, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm moderating on behalf of the Together We Can movement and it's a perfect way to add your voice to this movement and we will be delivering it to the next government. No matter who wins, but the next government will be surrounded by a huge movement of everyday Aussies who want stronger action on climate change and a big part of that, of course, is cleaning up our democracy. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, hopefully we can have some more of these conversations and... Have a great night. Here's to cleaning up democracy. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Really enjoyed it.